All right, Galatians chapter 6 for the message this morning. In our last message, we covered chapter 5, verses 16 to 26. We certainly didn't consider it in every detail. That's one of those passages we could spend quite a long time on. We could easily spend a month or more in the passage. We could do a whole series on the two natures. We could do a series on the fruit of the Spirit. In fact, we've done that. If you go on our YouTube channel and the playlist, there's one on the two natures, one on the fruit of the Spirit. And I refer to the passage uh, quite a bit in my preaching. So uh, I didn't, I decided, I thought about going back there again this morning, but we're going to go on into chapter six. And, and it's because when we go verse by verse through a book, I endeavor to try to stay with the flow and continuity of the context and not go off into a separate series of studies. In other words, when we do a topical series, that's the time to look at a topic in detail. If you stop and dealt with every topic that comes up in a verse-by-verse -verse study, you would never get through the verse-by-verse -verse study, right? So we, we're, we're trying to keep the flow of things, and the flow here in the context is on, the emphasis is on true spirituality. I started in chapter 5, verse 13, and runs through the end of the epistle. That's really the emphasis, and what's happening here is Paul is making the practical application of the sound doctrine that he has set forth in this epistle that were not under the law but under grace. He has written to correct the error of legalism, and he shows what true, spiritu true spirituality is under grace. Okay, So thus far, we've seen that the spiritual man does not abuse his liberty in Christ. He does not take his liberty and use it for an occasion to the flesh. But rather in love, he serves others. He does not run others down, biting and devouring, uh, but rather walks in the Spirit, is not under the law, does not continually manifest the works of the flesh, but rather bears the fruit of the Spirit and is dead to self. Okay, That pretty much sums up what we looked at in chapter 5, verse 13 to 26. Now, in the final chapter, we see that the spiritual man seeks to restore the fallen uh, in meekness. Chapter 6, verse 1, he helps to bear the burdens of others. That's verses 2 and 3. But he bears his own burden. In verses 4 and 5, he's a giver. Verses 6 to 10, sows to the Spirit, not the flesh. Verses 7 and 8, he glories in the cross, not in the flesh, but in the cross. Verses 11 to 16, and is willing to suffer for Christ's sake. And if you glory in the cross, not everybody appreciates that. The religious world does not glory in the cross. They glory in their flesh, and they persecute those that glory in the cross. Verses 17 and 18. So that's 15 things we're looking at in the passage regarding those who are truly spiritual. The spiritual man is in the Spirit, and the Spirit in him, that's true of all believers, but he walks in the Spirit. Okay, He knows the things of God by the Spirit of God. He appropriates it by faith and walks in it day by day. It's possible to be saved and yet carnal, like the Corinthians, giving place to the flesh. And if you put yourself under the law, you will be carnal. Okay, Because the Spirit of God doesn't lead you there. Uh, the spiritual man is not under the law, but is under grace. And Paul is talking about what this looks like in our daily walk. You know, Paul always lays out the sound doctrine first and then shows how it ought to be lived out and makes the proper application. So, uh, in the first part of chapter 6, Paul gives practical examples of how the fruit of the Spirit is to be demonstrated among the brethren. And uh, I, I tell you, it's important we meet together with other believers. It's important that we have that fellowship for many reasons, one of which it gives us an opportunity to live out our faith. And, uh, and so Paul's talking about dealing with people in the context of a, of a local church. 
And that ought to be where we demonstrate this fruit of the Spirit. We ought to demonstrate it in the home. We ought to de demonstrate it in the church. We ought to demonstrate it everywhere we go, day by day in our, in our daily walk. So as you think about the fruit of the Spirit, let's remind ourselves what that is. In chapter 5, verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Nine things that make up the fruit of the Spirit, and it is the moral character of Christ being formed in us by the Spirit of God. As we yield to the Spirit of God, He brings forth this fruit in our lives. Against such there is no law. As you think about those nine things, you see how they are demonstrated in the things He's going to talk about as we get into chapter 6. And as we get into chapter 6, I want to say this also. Paul's whole point in Galatians has been we're not under the law and we need to stand fast in our liberty in Christ, right? I mean, that's been the whole point. Yet, the fact we're not under the law of Moses does not mean we are a lawless people. There is still law that ought to govern how we live. For an example, the law of Christ. In Galatians 6, 2, he talks about the law of Christ, and that is love. At loving others as Christ loved us. He's going to talk about the law of the harvest in this chapter. You reap what you sow. That's a law. You're not getting around it. We still operate by the law of sowing and reaping. And not only that, look, there's different kinds of laws mentioned in the Bible. It's not, when you read the word law, it doesn't mean it's automatically talking about the law of Moses. I mean, for an example, and I won't go through the whole list, but another one is in Romans 8 where Paul said in verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So it's a different kind of thing, but law is a standard. It's something that's consistent. It's, 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 it's you know, the way it's going to be. And uh, as we yield to the Spirit of God, we ought to walk in that spirit of life. And, you know, the law brought condemnation and death, but in Christ we have, we have life. And so as, as we're spiritual and we have the love of God in our heart, and we understand that we reap what we sow, that ought to govern how we make decisions and how we do things. It's not this mindset that nothing matters anymore, anything goes. That's not true. It's not true at all. There are people out there that are what, they're, what they call it antinomian. They're again, they say no law. And some of these people even go so far as to say there is no sin today. Now, that's a big red flag when you hear somebody talking like that. I'd stay away from that. Okay, and I'm not going to stop and deal with all that right now. I'm just mentioning in the very epistle where Paul says we're not under law, he said we need to fulfill the law of Christ. And if the love of God's operating in our lives, we're going we're gonna to live right. The love of God's not going to lead us to live wrong. <laughs> okay, so verse 1, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual... There evidently was still some... I mean, not everybody in Galatia had, had been removed unto another gospel. There was still some holding the line. There was still some that were spiritual there. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted." Contrast that with how chapter 5 ended. Verse 26, Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. That's what it looks like when we're legalistic. Vainglory. We're self-righteous. And uh, we, we, we want to be over others, and so we will provoke them and we'll envy them. We want the glory for ourselves. You know... The legalistic Pharisees, they lived like chapter 5, verse 26. Everything they did, Jesus said, was to be seen of men. And they, they went about seeking vainglory, provoking others, envying others. That's the law. In other words, they, had put them, they were under the law and they were self-righteous. They, they were under it with the wrong attitude and the wrong heart. But nonetheless... 
contrast that with chapter 6, verse 1, and the spiritual man who's under grace, he's not looking for vain glory. He's looking to help others. He doesn't think he's better than other people. When someone falls, he considers himself, said, I, hey, I could do the same thing. I better help them. A, a spirit of meekness. Now, the word fault, if a man be overtaken in a fault, if you study that in the Bible, uh, you find other words related to it, like the word error in Daniel 6 verse 4, or trespass in Matthew 18, 15. And so, this man that's overtaken in a fault, this is not talking about someone who is willfully and consistently rebelling against the Word of God. You can't help people like that. If people reject what the Word of God says, they are going to disobey what the Word of God says, they have no desire to repent and agree with God, you know what Paul said about that kind of person? He said, put them out of the church. Okay, so let's understand what we're talking about. You, there's a difference between somebody getting overtaken and wanting help and someone who is a, a rebellious person. You, the little leaven leavens a whole lump. You've got to get the leaven out. Read it in 1 Corinthians 5. That man in 1 Corinthians 5, living in fornication, wasn't repenting, wasn't wanting help, was continuing in that. Paul said, get him out. Now, that was for his own good, and it eventually did lead to his restoration. He eventually did repent. But the point is, there's a difference between someone who is just living in rebellion and someone who messes up. Um, one who trips up in a moment of weakness and desires to be restored. When we talk about someone being overtaken, um, most of the references to overtaken in the Bible, and it's referred to 19 times, the word overtaken is twice, overtake is 17. So 19 total references, I believe it is, if I'm not mistaken. But if you look at how the word is used, it's often used in the context of military conflict. Okay, so for an example, and look at look if you wouldn't keep a marker here, but look in um, Psalm 18. And while you're finding that, I'll read to you from Exodus 15, this, uh, a song here that Moses and the children of Israel sang when they came through the Red Sea. In that song, it says in Exodus 15, in verse number 9, uh, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. I'll divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Talking about Pharaoh and his army. He said, I'm going to go after them. I'm going to pursue them and I'm going to overtake them. Of course, God judged Pharaoh and his armies and drowned them in the depth of the Red Sea. But the point is, this is an enemy. An enemy's trying to overtake. Well... In Psalm 18, and of course David was a great warrior. Notice what he said in Psalm 18. And, and the reason why he was is because of the Lord strengthening him for those battles. In Psalm 18, verse 37, I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that they were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. And so, in the context of military conflict, David said that he pursued his enemies and overtook them. So, think about the word overtaken in that regard, an enemy pursuing and overtaking Another way you could think about the word is, is being caught off guard or being surprised. Uh, Paul referred to uh, being overtaken by a thief in 1 Thessalonians 5, 4. Well, if a thief overtakes you, that's not something you're anticipating. It's something that catches you off guard. Now, here's the point of all this. Satan, our adversary, he has snares set for us. And as long as we have this corrupt flesh, it is possible to get overtaken. 
because he's always pursuing. He has wiles and snares and uh, all these different things. Paul warns us about how the devil works. And to be overtaken in a fault could be a doctrinal fault. And don't be, uh, minimize that. That's serious. That's what's going on in Galatia. There's doctrinal fault. It could be moral fault. And that really they go hand in hand. Bad doctrine produces bad behavior. And so they're overtaken. And the devil, look, he's relentless. That's why you better not slack up because he's not. You start taking him lightly and you take a break, put it in cruise control. He's not, he's not going to be... Look, he is relentless. He's pursuing. And you know what he's seeking to do? Bewitch people. Hinder people. That's what, I mean, we've already seen that in Galatians. Paul said, who hath bewitched you? He said, who did hinder you? Well, the devil did, but he was using, he was using false teachers to do it and evil spirits. So he's looking to bewitch. He's looking to hinder and he's looking to overtake. That's, I mean, he's at work. And we need to take that very seriously. Now, the good news is that we, if we get overtaken... We can be recovered, and we can be restored. Look in 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. It, look, it's not an, a matter of if we're going to be overtaken at some point. It's a matter of what are we going to do about it when we are. Because I don't think I'm preaching to a bunch of sinless people this morning. I mean, we, we all have the flesh, and as long as we have the flesh, we can be overtaken in a fall. All right, so the good news is we don't have to stay that way. We don't have to stay in that condition. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Now, and Paul also tells us to fight the good fight. Well, it depends on some things. There is a time to fight. There's a time not to fight. What he just said in the previous verse is not to uh, be dealing with these foolish and unlearned questions. Okay, some things you just need to ignore. Other things you need to stand up and fight about it. Okay, you need to know the difference. But he said, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men. See, that's the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Gentleness. Apt to teach. Patient. In meekness. There it is, fruit of the Spirit. Instructing those that oppose themselves. And when you go against the Word of God, you're just hurting yourself and those around you, but you are not gonna, you're not going to win. You're not going to succeed that way. It always leads to destruction. You're opposing yourself. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance, a change of heart and mind to what? The acknowledgement of... The acknowledging of the truth. Now God, God wants us when we're wrong to repent. The question is, are we going to acknowledge His truth? It's our, it's our choice whether we acknowledge it. And acknowledge it is not just a mental, okay, yeah, He's right. No, but a, a realization that, hey, I'm wrong, He's right, I'm agreeing with God against myself. Now notice that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by Him at His will. We're in a warfare. Satan's taken captives. He's got the snares set, and he's a master at setting the snares. He could take people captive at His will when they refuse to acknowledge the truth of God. If you won't acknowledge the truth of God's Word, you're a sitting target. The devil's not going to have no trouble taking you captive. He's looking to set up strongholds in your life. Paul uses military terms about these things because it's a war. Okay? And uh, people so worried about Iran. Man, they've been running their mouth forever. Give me a break. You ought to be worried about the devil. If more people get all upset about... You know, whatever the media tells them to, you know, like Iran or Russia or this coronavirus. 
You know, whatever happened to the bird flu and the swine flu? I mean, there's always something they're trying to keep you scared to death. And, and people sit there and they watch TV and they get all upset. You, if you're going to be upset about something, why don't you get upset about the devil's after your, is after you to destroy you? Now, he can't take your soul if you're saved, but he can mess your life up if you let him. If you give place to the devil, it's possible for a believer to give place to the devil. That's serious stuff. But he said that they may recover themselves. See, it's up to the individual if they want the help or not. I mean, if I tell someone the truth and I tell them this is how to do the right thing and this is what the right thing is and they rebel against it keep doing the wrong thing, I can't do anything at that point. You can't change someone's life for them. If they're not willing to repent and acknowledge that... Here's the point. Restoration is not possible without repentance. Okay? Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me show you. Now, every time we've... In the, by the grace of God, I can say this with a clear conscience. Over the years, I've always tried to help restore the fallen. But if a person won't repent and follow the Word of God, then I can't do nothing about it, my friend. You know, the, the pastor doesn't have a magic wand to make everybody right with God. My job is to tell them what the Word of God says. What they do with it is up to them. And so, we can be recovered from the snare of the devil, but a person has to recover themselves by acknowledging the truth of God. And by the way, in the context of what we were just looking at in 2 Timothy 2, he was talking about false doctrine. And uh, the key is rightly dividing the word of truth. That will keep us out of the false doctrine. But um, 2 Corinthians 1, you remember I, I, I alluded to the man in 1 Corinthians 5 that Paul said to put out of the church. Well, they did. First of all, the church at Corinth was too lax, letting him go on in that sin in their church. And then when he repented, they were too harsh and wouldn't let him back in. They go from one extreme to the other. That's how people are, aren't they? Paul says, no, now it's time to forgive and restore because he had repented. And by the way, people are more likely to repent when you deal with them according to the Word of God than your own human psychology. I just think that, I just feel that, doesn't matter. I don't appreciate the way you handle it. I don't care. If, if the Word of God says how to do something, that's what we do. I mean, I'm, I literally mean that. I don't care what people's opinions are about how to handle issues when we got the Holy Scripture right here that tells us how to do it. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody thinks they know better. We got a Bible. That's the authority. Okay? And as long as I'm the pastor of the church, that's what we're going to follow. <laughs> okay? Not everybody, I know y'all appreciate it, that's why you're here. Not everybody has though, <laughs> okay? Second Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number, well, let's see here. Let's just jump in at verse number 6. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrary wise ye ought rather to forgive them. All right, now that he's repented, he needs to be restored and comfort him, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything. Now, here's the key to forgiveness as far as practically speaking among the brethren and whatever. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, how do we do it? For your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Be a kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. See, he's always trying to get in, isn't he? You harbor unforgiveness, you'll become a tool of the devil. You harbor unforgiveness and bitterness, and you'll become a tool of the devil to mess up a church. I, every time. Paul said, no, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Now, I think nowadays, you, we, every time I read that, his devices, I think about iPhone and iPad and idolatry and... <laughs> 
Because a lot of people spread all this junk over those devices. If we're not ignorant of his devices. For, uh, so understand there comes a point now of the, the forgiveness and the restoration, but it's conditioned on repentance. If a man is not going to acknowledge the truth, he can't be helped. So you always deal with people on the truth of the Word of God. So the spiritual believer who bears the fruit of the Spirit love and, and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and meekness, they are going to seek and desire to restore the fallen, not destroy them. When you see someone fall, and you look on them and you say, I would never do that. You are full of pride and are destined to fall. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You would do, look, your flesh is just as sorry. And mine is too. So get off your high horse, you know. Give me a break. We better have the right attitude about this thing. I mean, in other words, Paul said, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. You know when he said that? 1 Corinthians 10, right after talking about Israel messing up in the wilderness, and we look, so oh, those sorry Jews, you know, they're always doing this and that. But the church at Corinth was doing the same kind of garbage. He said, you better take heed or you're going to fall in the same kind of temptation. Now, you can't fall out of your salvation, but you can fall into temptation and you can fall from grace, like Paul wrote about in Galatians. These kind of things. Peter said, I'll never deny you. I'll never do it, Lord. I mean, everybody else might, but not me. <laughs> Down he goes. Self-confidence, you see. That pride, that's the issue. I mean, it'll get you every time. It's the condemnation of the devil. Pride, a serious sin that must be taken seriously, not taken lightly. So when you see someone falling, the right attitude is to say, man, I, I'd, I, in love and long-suffering and gentleness, goodness, hey, I'd like to help these people. If I can help them, I want to help them. You don't want to gossip about them and run them down and kick them while they're down and say, hey, I'd never do that and all this. Taking time to consider ourselves that we are capable of being overtaken also will help keep us humble. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. The body of Christ is to treat one another with lowliness and meekness. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Here's the right attitude among the brethren. Here's the right attitude in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore... The prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the union of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice that lowliness and meekness, long suffering, forbearance, all that. Look in uh, Philippians. I mean, it's all through here. Philippians chapter 2. And of course, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians emphasize the body of Christ. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. That's the flesh. Rather, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. That's not what we do naturally in our flesh. So how do we do it? Look, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That's the key. Colossians 3, verse uh, 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, uh, meekness, long-suffering, 
forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the right attitude. When you're dealing with someone who's been overtaken and they want to be helped, then you say, look, that could happen to me. And I would want someone to help me. Um, and you reach out to help them. And, and the church needs to restore those who are overtaken. But there's a way to go about that. But it can't happen without repentance. If a person's not going to acknowledge their fault and not agree with God concerning the matter, they can't be helped. And uh, we try to be very uh, tender-hearted toward people who are repentant. There's a difference in attitude when you're dealing with someone who's in rebellion and someone who is in repentance. All you got to look at the Lord Jesus and how he dealt with people. He didn't deal with their. It depends, man. And you got to know the difference. Some people they don't have any discernment. They they just they always think they know better and know everything. But follow the word of God; it'll give you discernment. Look, please, in Galatians chapter six. <coughs> Verse 2 and 3. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. Now, some burdens in life are transferable in that others can help carry the load. There are things that we can help one another with. In the context, by the way, he's going to be talking about financial burden. Because he says in verse 6, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Communication there is talking about giving and receiving. Verse 10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially them of the household of faith. He's talking about giving. We can help one another if we're a giving people. So there are things that we can help one another with. And look, we all have burdens. A burden is a load. <laughs> it, 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 we get weary. We, we get down with it. I mean, you know, and there, there are burdens in life, and they're all kind of burdens. It may be financial. It may be physical. It may be emotional. It may be spiritual. It may, there's all kind of burdens, and there are things we can help one another with, okay? But if you go about always trying to bear every burden on your own because of your pride and you don't want God's help or anybody else's, then you're just, you're just going to get run down. You can't deal with it. You can't handle it. And the, 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 the wonderful thing is, is that whatever burdens we have, there are resources to bear those burdens. Number one, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. That's Psalm 55, 22. You do that by faith. You say, Lord, I'm trusting you. He'll give you comfort. He'll give you strength. He'll give you joy and peace. He'll give you what you need to bear the burden. And then the local church, if you're in a local church, we can bear one another's burdens. So if you got the Lord and the church helping you bear burdens, you ought not to be so weighed down with them, right? And so we have these resources. And what a wonderful thing it is to know the Lord and to be in a church that we can help one another. I think about what the Lord said when He said, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Remember? He said, Take my yoke upon you. He said, Learn of me. He said, I'm meek and lowly. The spirit of meekness, that's the mind of Christ. He said, My yoke is easy. My burden is light. If he's, a yoke is for service, a yoke of oxen, if he's pulling with you, that's light. If we can't, if we're so burdened down, we can't handle the ministry, you know, and we can't handle serving the Lord, and we can't handle the things that life throws at us because we're trying to bear it on our own. There's a lot of things you can't handle. But if we cast our burden upon the Lord by faith and trust the Lord, and we have a church to help us with the burden, that certainly goes a long way, and it's a wonderful blessing. I think about what Paul said about the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25, when he said that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. 
or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you're the body of Christ, and members in particular. When we know of a need someone has and we can do something to help them, we certainly ought to do that. You know? What, I mean, we ought to be aware. If we're praying for one another and we're mindful of one another, when we see there's a need that we can help with, we ought to step up and do what we can to help. And what a blessing it is to have that. But the law of Christ, he said, when you bear one another's burdens, you are fulfilling the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to love one another as he loved us. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. That's sacrificial love. Charity among the brethren is a quality of love that sacrifices and puts others first. He said in John 15 in verse number 12 that this is my commandment that you love one another as I, have, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. A servant is willing, look, it, it, it demands sacrifice. We, we, we're serving others. It's not about self, it's about others. Love will motivate us to sacrificially serve others. That's why he said in Galatians 5.13, Brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. One of the ways we serve one another is bear one another's burdens. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love is mentioned first in the nine-part fruit of the Spirit because it produces the rest. It starts with having the right love. That's so crucial. But I think, again, about the Pharisees, those legalists. You know, they, they didn't help anybody with a burden. They added burdens to people. You know what the Lord said when he was ripping their face off in Matthew 23? And he was. Read it. You people who think it's always wrong. Every time it's like, oh, it's negative. It's so negative. Yeah. Pray about it. And Matthew chapter, I got a Bible that tells me how to preach, okay? Matthew chapter 23 and verse number 4. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. All right, that's how the legalists are. But Paul said, no, bear you one another's burdens. And you know what's going to prevent people from doing that? Thinking you're something. If a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. You know, anyone who thinks they're too good to fall, as in verse 1, you won't consider yourself lest you also be tempted. You think you're too good to fall and mess up, and you're too good to serve others, verse 2, you've deceived yourself, and you're not thinking soberly. Paul said, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think soberly. Romans 12, verse 3. He said, if you think highly of yourself, you're not thinking soberly. You're a nut. Okay? Here's the truth of the matter. Our flesh is, ready for it? Here it is, nothing. Paul said, that's what you are. You're a big fat zero with the rim rubbed out. That's in the Greek. <laughs> you are nothing. That's what that Bible says about that flesh again and again. Jesus said, the flesh profiteth nothing. John 6, 63, Paul said, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Romans 7, 18, Paul said, we're not sufficient of ourselves as to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. You see, that's the key. Now, I'm not talking about a false humility that just says I'm nothing and then that's it. No, you are nothing. Now, trust the Lord. He'll make you something. In 2 Corinthians 
uh, uh, 12, 11, I think it is, Paul said, um, uh, I am become a fool in glory, you have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing uh, am I behind the very chiefest apostles. But notice what he said. And this is Paul now. Paul, whom God used in such a great way. What did Paul say about himself? 2 Corinthians 12, 11, Though I be nothing. That's what we are. Without the Lord, we're nothing. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Okay? So, in our flesh, we are nothing. If we think we're something, we've deceived ourselves. If we think we know something, it only proves that we know nothing. And uh, boy, there's so many references. I mean, Paul, and look, the Bible never has anything positive to say about that flesh. It just doesn't. In 1 Corinthians 8, verse 3, he said if, uh, that, uh, verse 2, If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. And so, if you, you know... A man that's strong in the faith and is spiritual, when he looks at those that are weak, the right attitude is this. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. That's just the bottom line of it. You see, the legalists think they're something because they're self-righteous. You remember that Pharisee stood in the temple to pray and said, Lord, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. <laughs> And by the way, you can be a quiet, arrogant person. You may not voice it, but sometimes that old nose in the air does just enough to let people know that you're a stuck-up snob. And that's what self-righteousness will do. All right, almost done. Verse 4. Let's hit this real quick. Galatians 6, 4. But let every man prove his own work. Then shall he have rejoicing in himself and not in another for every man shall bear his own burden. There's no contradiction. He said, bear one another's burdens. Then he said, bear your own burden. Well, there, that both are true. There's not a contradiction. There are burdens that others can help us bear, but then there are burdens that we must bear on our own. It's our own responsibility and duty, and we can't shrug that off on someone else. You know the difference? There was a teacher of yesteryear that I, I have a lot of his books. I, th I think he did a good job for the most part. His name was Layman Strauss. And he said this. Listen to what he said. He said, in verse 2, I am told to aid my brother who has failed in carrying out his responsibility. While in verse 5, I am exhorted not to fail to carry out my own personal, private responsibility. My task is my own. Hence, I have no right to expect someone else to assume it for me. I am to avoid being lazy and careless about my own obligations and at the same time be ready to assist him who may need my help. In the armed forces, each soldier must bear his own pack. But when a buddy is wounded on the field of battle, the soldier who has not been struck by the enemy comes to the aid of the wounded one. So verse 2 suggests... An opportunity to serve others. Verse 5 reminds us that before God, everyone will bear his own load. So both are true. He said, prove your own work. In other words, we, look, basically what he's saying in verse 4 is we are to test and examine our own work that it is the quality the Lord desires because there is great joy in serving God in such a manner. A joy that is not dependent on what others do or don't do. Right? Serve the Lord, your own work, doing it the right way in the Lord's strength, and you will have rejoicing, he said, in himself alone. In other words, there's a great joy and satisfaction that comes in serving God from a right heart and serving others. He said, prove your own work. Every man shall bear his own burden. As we close this morning, think about those words and ask yourself, can what we do as Christians honestly be called work and a burden? You know, the Christian life is not a playground. There is great peace and joy and all that, but there's a work to do. And Paul was so burdened about lost souls, he said about his brethren, the, the lost Jews. He was so burdened for his lost 
people that he said, I could wish that myself were accursed. He said, I have great sorrow and continual heaviness in my heart. He was burdened for his people. And there's a work and there's a burden. And look, you're going to stand one day at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of whether or not you did. And, and nobody, you can't say, well, so and so, you know, I would have done it, Lord, but so and so, but so, no, they did this. And he's going to, yeah. <laughs> you had me. Bear your own burden. See, there's a point where we help one another, but there's a point we got, we got to stand on our own two feet, give an account of our own service to the Lord. And there's not going to be excuses in that day. We all must give an account of ourselves at the judgment seat of Christ. And um, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3 that, you know, we, we plant, we water, and we do this together. So there's a unity, but then there's also the individuality of now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. That's the teamwork. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Okay? So we, in a local church, we can help bear the burden of the ministry. We can help one another. But then there are things we have to bear on our own. And of course, when I say on our own, we, in the Lord's strength. In the Lord's strength. You know, there's a saying around here that says, Well, I'll tell you one thing. God will never put more on you than you can bear. Well, actually that's not the case. But uh, Paul said he got so pressed down one time, he was above strength. He said, I couldn't handle it. But he said, I had the sentence of death in myself that I would not trust in myself but in the living God. If you trust the Lord and cast your burdens on the Lord, there's a lot we can't handle in our own strength. But if we trust the Lord, that's the key. And so true spirituality, you will have a desire to restore the fallen. You won't look down on them and think you're better than they are. You look... The spiritual man knows he is what he is by the grace of God. So how, do you, how are you going to look down on someone? And, and, and he is going to have the law of Christ in operation in that he's going to love others to the point he's going to sacrifice and give. And he's going to serve and help others where he can. Now look, folks, not everybody will take your help. There are people you try to help and they don't want your help. You, what can you do? But where you can, do what you can. But then also you, you have your own responsibilities too. Okay. So that, uh, we'll stand and end with that.